Hello, my name is Joseph Trackman, and we're going to give you a presentation on epigenetics. And it may be a new term to you, but we're going to explain it in a few minutes. Um, before we start, I would like to thank the WeWorks facility and the Veterans in Residence program, or else I wouldn't uh, have the opportunity to do this. And although you can't see him, I'd like to thank one of my fellow veterans, Brian, who's at the camera and uh, uh, all the adjustments. Before we start, I would just like to make a special mention because today, today is D-Day, and uh, my namesake, my father's cousin, Joseph Telesnik, died on Utah Beach on D-Day. And although you can't see it, this is his record from the World War II uh, Memorial. So as a, an overview, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the Human Genome Project, and that's how we uh, developed our understanding of uh, epigenetics. And we're going to talk about one mutation uh, in particular, and that's the MTHFR mutation, which we're going to explain, which affects about 45% of the U.S. population. And uh, the goal is to describe the mutation, the diagnosis, treatment, and the sequela of the mutation. So here's the general outline. As we mentioned, the genome project, we're going to define epigenetics. We're going to talk about the Nobel Prize winners uh, in this field. Then we're going to talk specifically about the methylation cycle and how it relates to our body's function. And then we're going to mention and list some of the diseases related to the MTHFR mutation and then some other mutations that are also amenable to epigenetics. So the Human Genome Project was one of the uh, greatest endeavors that science has undertaken to identify all the genes in humans. And it <clears throat> was completed in 2003 and has given us some very uh, important and essential information about how we can deal with our health and make ourselves healthier and happier. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's the word epigenetics. So, so you could read this, but simply epigenetics is a way to manage the, your genes with, if, if you have mutations by external factors. Epi means outside. Previously, we believed that if once you had a mutation, that was it. There was, wasn't anything you can do about it, and you just had to suffer, and some of the mutations are quite bad, very serious. And now we're learning that we can manage them, and we're going to explain specifically how we can manage the MTHFR mutation. Okay. <clears throat> now, epigenetics is an evolving science. And you can see here just April 11th and another recent uh, article. <clears throat> this one is that the epigenetics uh, or manipulation of the DNA from outside can replace chemotherapy. And also, uh, they're actually doing this now that by doing genetic testing, we can learn what drugs are good for people and what drugs are not good for people. So this can help us optimize treatment for patients. Now, some of my patients who I have recommended doing the genetic testing, particularly for the MTHFR mutation, because it's fairly common, um, go back to their, to their doctor, and the doctor said he never heard of this. And patient comes back and said, why do you want to do this? My doctor said, he never heard of this. So that's why I have this slide. So the 2012 Nobel Prize winner for, was for work done on epigenetics. So this is mainstream medicine. This is not a fringe kind of thing. This is very, very important. 
and then the next year, 2013, the runners-up in the same prize for physiology or medicine was for their work on methylation. So this is cutting edge, this is new, and it's very important that not only the public know about it, but all healthcare practitioners should be very aware of this because this is the future of healthcare. Okay, so <clears throat> what is a methylation? So here we see every cell in the body has its own methylation cycle. And what the methylation cycle does is it, as we're going to see in future slides, is it breaks down folic acid, vitamin B9, to the usable form in the body, which is methylfolate. Now, people who have the mutation don't have the enzyme, which we'll describe, to break this down, and that's why they have health problems. Okay. Now, why is methylation important? It's important here for four major reasons. We'll give you some other reasons later, but the four major reasons are that the, each cell in the body has its own methylation cycle, just like every cell in the body has its own mitochondria and nucleus, etc. From the methylfolate, the methyl group goes to the cell's DNA and RNA for the cell to work properly. If the cell does not get enough methylation, the DNA and RNA are going to give bad messages, and that's bad news. It means bad health. Okay. Methylfolate is a precursor for what we call a category of brain chemicals called catecholamines, and that includes serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Homocysteine is an amino acid that is related to blood vessel permeability, migraine headaches, and cardiovascular disease. And the fourth is mitochondria. That you will, will, I'll show you that the mitochondria needs a chemical from the methylation cycle for it to produce the energy, what we know as ATP. So here's a, a, a diagram that helps explain this. So here's, we have the vitamin B9 folic acid, methyl, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, that's an MTHFR is the acronym, needs to be converted to the usable form in the body, which is methylfolate. When there is a faulty gene for the enzyme, that's when the problems begin in the methylation cycle. So once again, every cell in the body has its own methylation cycle. So whether it's a hair cell, a blood cell, skin cell, heart cell, cell in the retina, every cell has its own methylation cycle. And because of the interaction with other mutations, it's going to affect some cells more than others. This we don't know too much about the interaction among all the, all the genes, but little by little we're learning more and more. As mentioned before, methylfolate is a precursor to these uh, catecholamines, and you can see from the slide all the different uh, important functions that these chemicals regulate and are involved in. So there's a lot of information here, but what's most important is this word or this acronym, SNPS, SNPs. It just means mutation. In scientific terms, it's called a single nucleotide polymorphism. So some of you may be interested in uh, this uh, pursuit further, and you'll probably come across the term SNPs, and that's why I wanted to put this on here. Now, interestingly enough, that the MTHFR genetic sequence in the bacteria E. coli is almost exactly the same as it is in humans. So to me, what does it mean? It means that it's a very basic and essential part of life. That if a, if a, if a single cell bacteria could have the same sequence as us, this is very basic, 
And that's why it's so important. Okay. So th one question is, how is this mutation transmitted? So it's an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. So what does that mean? If one parent has one mutation and the other parent has another mutation, for example, if they have four children, one will have a mutation from each, two will have one mutation, and one will not have it. It's not a dominant, so it's recessive. So this is an example of some of the mutations in the, mu in the methylation cycle from the 23andMe uh, test. So these are the two major MTHFR mutations, the C variation and the A variation. Now, typically, people who have this, this one or this one, one of the MTHR, the main uh, variants, will also have a vitamin D receptor mutation. Yeah. So this one is MTHFR C. 677T, and this one is MTHFR A1298C. <clears throat> so those are the two main variants, and they can occur in pairs. You can have two C variations, you can have one, you can have one A variation, you can have two A variations, or you could have one A and one C. As mentioned before, it's quite usual for people who have either the A or C variation to have one of the vitamin D receptor mutations. And here in Seattle, that's very critical because everybody here that I have tested is deficient in vitamin D. And here's the catecholamine mutation, and that's also uh, common to happen to people who have one of the MTHFR, either A or C variations. So this is um, maybe a little confusing, but let's just look at it simply. Okay, here is the enzyme, and here is the methylfolate that we need. Okay, and there's a parallel chemical cycle over here, and here you can see the homocysteine. So what happens is, if there's not enough of the methylfolate, the homocysteine builds up, it accumulates, it's not metabolized and causes health problems. So we, we see that the methylfolate is related to homocysteine metabolism, DNA and the RNA, the neurotransmitters. And if we look up here, we'll see on another slide that this chemical goes to the mitochondria to help it produce ATP. Yes? Well, epigenetics is how we address the mutations. So what I'm explaining here is why is it, why is it important to know about this? And people are curious, what is what, you know, something you don't learn in school. So we have to educate people about what the mutation is and why it's important to encourage them to be tested. And if they have it, it's, then they realize it's important to take the supplements to compensate for the lack of the chemical. So this is another uh, example of the complexity of the whole uh, methylation process. <clears throat> so on this slide, the homocysteine's on the right rather than the left. But here's the methylation cycle, and here's the homocysteine, okay? And here's the vitamin D. And now over here in the corner, over here in the corner is the big no-no cortisol. Everyone knows what cortisol is? Cortisol is the stress hormone. And what, you, what happens is that even if all your biochemistry is nice and in balance, everything's fine, you have an increase in cortisol, it knocks everything down. So 
says that homocysteine cycle causes blood health issues. It says homocysteine cycle causes blood health issues. Okay. Homocysteine, as mentioned before, affects the permeability of the blood vessels. So it's related to migraine headaches in particular and cardiovascular problems. And also, if you go on the internet and you Google homocysteine and diseases, you'll come up with hundreds of, of uh, diseases related to it. Just trying to be uh, simple in the answer. Okay, so what happens is if you have permeability problems, then you're going to have leakage of your blood vessels and blood's going to come out and cause uh, hemorrhages. So, for example, uh, I'm an eye doctor, so I look in people's eyes as part of the exam. And um, with high blood pressure and diabetes, you can see hemorrhages on the retina. And if they're not addressed, they can cause uh, blindness, more so uh, the diabetes than the high blood pressure, but still you can actually see the hemorrhages. And if they're happening in the eye, they're happening in the brain and other places as well. Okay, so th this slide also um, shows the whole process, but what I want to show you is here that this chemical, the 10-formal tetrahydrofolate, goes to the mitochondria to produce, as you'll see on the next slide, the energy, the ATP. And here's the ATP, and that gives us gives the cell the energy and it gives us the body energy. Many of my patients who have the MTHFR mutation, by early afternoon, they've had it. They, they, they just don't have any more energy. And once we get them methylated, um, it makes a very big difference. So now this is epigenetics, okay? So what can we do about our mutations. Okay. So stress, as mentioned before, this is the big no-no. Okay. So you have to take care of yourself. You have to drink enough water. You have to take time during the day to slow yourself down. Make sure you get enough sleep. And the things that most people know, but I'm just stressing it because if you have the mutation, it may it's disproportionate. If you're don't have the mutation and you, you exercise a lot and you have a healthy diet, the mutation will have a minimal effect. But if you have any stress, as I showed you on the slide, it just crashes everything. Okay, exercise, aerobic exercise is one of the best ways to balance the nervous system. So regular aerobic exercise is very important. As mentioned before, other mutations will affect how the MTHFR mutation uh, produces problems uh, for any person uh, individually. And as I said, we're learning more and more about this all the time. Okay. There are certain medications that are contraindicated with the people who have the MTHFR mutation and are taking the supplement for that. And one of them is the very common medication for people who have depression, the SSRIs, which you may all have heard about. And um, what happens is that, as we know, people with MTHFR are not producing enough serotonin. So th there's not enough serotonin for the SSRI to work on, so it builds up. It's not metabolized, and usually what happens if a certain dosage doesn't work, the doctor makes a higher dosage, and those people run into very bad problems. And when I see them, we have to get them off the SSRIs and get them uh, the good supplements to get them feeling better. Okay, okay. and we're going to talk about this shortly, that the, the supplement, particularly MT, uh, H, MTHF methylfolate, is the main supplement for this. Now. We read about this all the time. There's a big controversy about whether uh, people who uh, say they're gluten-free, whether it's all in their head, or there's actually something wrong. 
So if 45% of the U.S. population have a form of the MTHFR mutation, the, the gluten blocks the absorption of folate in the intestines. So these are the people who are gluten intolerant. And that's why uh, there's such a, a big push now for gluten-free products. So uh, just as a quick aside, uh, I have a little sign like this printed out and I give it to my patients to remind them to be gluten-free. For, for some people, it's a very big problem for them to break their gluten habit and for others, uh, in fact, most of them who have the mutation already are gluten-free because they realize that the gluten makes them sick. Okay. Now, how do we test for the MTHFR mutation? So there's uh, a variety of ways. One is that um, you can have a blood test done. Um, the second I showed you before was 23andMe, um, but 23andMe, is they're now sharing their data so we stopped using them, and we're starting to use now from Max Gen Labs, which actually gives a, a lot more information uh, than we were getting from 23andMe. And, and these two are saliva tests, so they can actually do it at, in your home, put some saliva in a little tube, send it to them, and then after uh, several weeks, you'll get the results, or I'll get the results and help them interpret it. So. Uh, we also have people tested to measure their homocysteine level. Vitamin B12 is related. Vitamin D, as mentioned before. Uh, nitric oxide. We use nitric oxide test strips to monitor the effectiveness of the methylfolate supplement. There is a blood test for folate, but it includes other things like folonic acid and folic acid but we don't know the proportion of those in, from the test. So nitric oxide is a good indirect measure, so this way we know whether patients are getting enough methylfolate supplement or not enough. And the, 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 there's a, another mutation called CBS, and then uh, if they have those, we have them tested for ammonia and taurine. Okay, so these are the supplements. As mentioned before, the main supplement is methylfolate, B12, vitamin D3, and the B vitamins B2 and B6. Now, some uh, patients will still not be methylated even after taking a substantial dose of methylfolate, so we supplement that either with betaine hydrochloride or trimethylglycine, <clears throat> which have methyl groups in it that can help the methylation cycle. And, and this is another chemical in the homocysteine side that some people also find helpful to balance out their methylation. That's a good question. So if you take something like any of those four vitamins listed, what will that do? Like that will enhance your... Okay, so, well, so no, num number one, it will help you get methylated. Okay, number two, as mentioned before, many patients who have the MTHFR mutation are deficient in vitamin D and B12. So, and then we also give B2 and B6 to help because some patients, even with all the other supplements, the homocysteine still stays high, so the extra B vitamins help bring it down. So let me put it another way. So after I get the genetic profile for any patient, then I customize the supplementation. So there's no one fixed regimen. It's based on people's uh, profile and, and their diet and the other uh, factors that affect methylation. And we customize it and we, we monitor uh, the B12, the homocysteine, and the D3, and the nitric oxide to make sure that everything's coming back into a good balance. Okay, I'm just going to explain this one over here. Why do I have this up here? For a few reasons. One, on the, uh, the label on prenatal vitamins, it will usually say 400 micrograms of folate. Okay. 
And then, and this is from a textbook that uh, naturopaths use at Bastyr. This is one of the textbooks they have there. So what does it say? It says, high dose long-term supplementation is indicated only with demonstrated need. So some people only read over to here. So what does the last sentence say? Genetic testing of MTHFR may be prudent with refractory homocysteine elevation. So what is that saying is that if the homocysteine is high, then you're going to have to increase how much methylfolate you're taking. And 400 micrograms is nearly not enough because we usually prescribe for an adult 15 milligrams, which is about 25 times more uh, than that. So I just point this out, and some of my patients also will come back at me and say, I went to my doctor, and he says, you're crazy that you shouldn't take more than 400 micrograms. So I have this printed out on a piece of paper, and I hand it to them, and I say, here, go have your doctor read the last two sentences. Now, who are some patients who are at risk? Okay. Because I'm an eye doctor, the four leading causes, the four major causes of blindness are related to MTHFR. So I've had patients, for example, who have glaucoma, which is an increase in the eye pressure inside the eye, and the medication doesn't help, and once we get the methylated, the pressure comes down. And the same thing with these other diseases, that once they get methylated, it, it, the problem either will go away or be markedly reduced and or be easier to manage. Okay. Now, what are some of the others? There are reports that uh, children who have ADD or who are labeled ADD or ADHD have MTHFR, as well as children who have been diagnosed as being autistic or being on the autistic spectrum. So there are reports that 80 to 90% of these children have MTHFR. As I'm going to show you in a subsequent slide, that my experience is that children who have been diagnosed ADD or ADHD and autistic spectrum have low muscle tone because of the mutation. And because of the low muscle tone, they just don't develop uh, in the way that they should. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to show you a case history about that. It's a good question, and I'm going to show you. Okay. Gluten sensitivity, we mentioned, hypotonia, low muscle tone, Lyme disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Marfan. Now, here's very important. that Why do the prenatal vitamins have methylfolate to prevent miscarriages and birth defects? So this is very important. That Women in childbearing age should be on a good dosage of methylfolate. They should be tested for MTHFR. And if they have it, they should uh, get themselves methylated properly. <clears throat> now, uh, Suzax is a, these two are unusual, but they're very important. But this is more common, traumatic brain injury and PTSD. <clears throat> All the patients that I have seen, now I'm only practicing 50 years, so you know, I, what do I know? Um, but all the patients I've seen who have a traumatic brain injury have MTHFR. And why, I think, is that they don't have the neurophysiological wherewithal to recover. Once we get them methylated, their progress in the rehabilitation is much faster, and they do, then they can get much better. Now. There was a study done a few years ago at the University of California in San Diego, which found that the PTSD is related to the catecholamine mutation. Remember, I showed you the 23andMe slide, and on top was the COMT mutation. So they have found that PTSD is related to that mutation. But as mentioned before, the catecholamines need to have methylfolate to be produced. Yes? So a couple of those items, Lyme disease, Externally driven, right? People don't get 
Lyme disease without an impetus. Okay, but it's, 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 it's are okay. you saying that people who have the, the defect are more likely to see the the symptom? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly correct so, so because so the, the the body doesn't can't react to it properly. For example, two people can be in the same accident, and one person in a few days will be fine, and another person it, they will linger on for years. And why? Because some people don't have the chemicals in their body to to get over it. And, and each of those diseases have been studied to be linked to that defect? Or? This is just a small sample. If you Google MTHFR and diseases, you're going to come up with hundreds. I just put some of the more common ones here that I have had experience with. But it, 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 understand it, what I mentioned before, that the genetic sequence of the of the enzyme, the MTHFR enzyme, in E. coli and humans almost the same. So it's a basic, very essential. And as I showed you on that big slide of the, the chemical cycles, the, the methylation's right in the middle. It's right in the middle. If you're not if you're not methylated, other things just aren't going to work properly. So I've been doing some uh, research into this. So I reported on uh, methyl MTHFR and traumatic brain injury 2013, as well as low muscle tone. I uh, published an article in 2015, how antifungals uh, interfere with the methylation cycle, and people who have MTHFR have to be careful taking certain antifungals, and we're gonna explain that. <coughs> and the signs and symptoms of MTHFR and mitochondrial disease are very similar, and I presented that at the mitochondrial conference. I'll show you that. And then um, uveitis is an inflammation of the, uh, one of the layers of the eye and uh, blockage of blood vessels in the retina and high eye pressure. So these are, th and I'm going to show you some of that uh, presentations and publications. Okay, so here in 2015, uh, my colleague, Dr. Megan and I, uh, we sent out a press release about PTSD and the COMT and TBI and uh, MTHFR. Okay. So in 2013, um, we presented on low muscle tone and MTHFR and vision and um, in the 1940s and 1950s, there was a, a, a researcher at Yale University named Arnold Gazelle, who's MD, and he did lots of work on child development, and what he found was that vision development depends upon gross motor development. So we have gross motor development as the, pure, as the bottom of the pyramid, the foundation, then fine motor, then vision motor, eye hand, and vision. So the children who have low muscle tone, because they have faulty gross motor development, will develop vision problems. And because they have vision problems, they're going to have learning problems, and they're going to have behavior problems. <clears throat> so this just uh, points this out. And you know, in, t in 2013, six years ago, this was quite novel. So this I presented uh, last year, and the, uh, the meeting was in Bellevue, so I didn't have to travel too far uh, to get there. But this was, uh, is a case history, and this is very typical. Uh, a seven-year-old boy that they were ready to diagnose him with uh, autistic spectrum disorder and give him all kinds of medication, and the mother wanted a second opinion. And so what did we find? <clears throat> that he, was, he had poor academic performance, and when I uh, gave him a, eye, a vision evaluation, I found his vision skills very bad. He had low muscle tone, and the reason for the low muscle tone was the MTHFR. So MTHFR caused the hypotonia, caused the vision and motor skills problems. So we gave him uh, supplementation, the methylfolate. We gave him some vision training. 
And as a result, his vision improved, his visual motor skills improved, his concentration improved, his academic performance improved, and he was no longer going to be not diagnosed to be on the autistic spectrum. Well, he, it, 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 a lot of parents will tell me that, okay? And I, I have a hand dynamometer that electronically measures the strength, and, and the, the parents will say, no, no, he's very strong, and then I have him do it, and, the, and they have low muscle tone. He's like, I think he's like 99 percentile in terms of size. That's, that's fine. That's but, sure. and it, it could be that when he was younger, that he didn't, uh, he had a little muscle tone, and maybe through his physical activity, it increased. But there's still going to be these other factors involved. Yes. Okay. Let me let me explain it this way. <clears throat> I, I've been uh, dealing with autistic children since 1970. So I was in graduate school at Johns Hopkins, where in 1943 they first. Uh, coined the term autism, okay. and in 1970, autism meant that they were hair pullers, arm biters, and head bangers, very bad behavior. And I wrote a paper about this in, in 2008. And what has happened is that the diagnostic criteria for autism has become lenient, more lenient, lenient, lenient and, and now almost anybody could be classified as being on the spectrum. So I don't recognize the spectrum as being anything more than th this kind of situation. It's not the hardcore autistic children that I, used to s that, I, that I used to see. I was on the board of directors of a school for autistic children for 17 years uh, in New York with the, the, the very severe ones. And the, the completely different kind of problems than on the spectrum. And put it another way, just like this young boy that uh, we're talking about here, is very common, okay? And one of the telltale, uh, telltale signs is that when they come in the office, they start touching everything. Why? Because they're not using their vision as their space sense because they never developed from the motor to the visual motor. So they're touching everything. So I could, before they get into the examining chair, already know what's the problem. So, uh, with the supplements also help with people that are as far as maybe like a 23-year-old or like early 20s as well? It's very important to get tested and methylated because when you get older, like me, okay, if you don't take care of yourself when you're younger, the problems when you get older are exponential. You don't want to know about it. So you should find, if you, if you are curious about it, you could take the, uh, a saliva test, you know, it's painless, and you can find out all about it, if you have it or if you don't have it, and if you do have it, what mutations you have. And the MaxGen uh, also has a, a, a program where they'll tell you what foods to eat and what foods not to eat, depending on your uh, genetic testing. So all these things are available now, and as I said, uh, I'm 73, okay, most of my contemporaries have retired if they're still alive and healthy be because they don't have any energy. Or they're, or they're very sick. And, and when I talk to them, they say, what are you doing? Oh, you know, Sunday I gave a four and a half hour lecture to a, a group of physical therapists and then Thursday I'm giving one on epigenetics. And said, how do you do this? And so you have to take care of yourself. And the earlier you start, the better off you are. Okay. So this is what I presented at the mitochondrial conference, just to show the similarities between the mitochondrial disease as MTHFR. So. Yeah. Well, I think you, maybe you need your eyes examined. I don't know. 
Okay. So this is the this is the ens essence of it, that um, <clears throat> the, the the similarities between the two. For example, the 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 SAM and the ATP and the SHMT uh, chemicals are deficient in both. Okay. They also have migraine headaches, um, uh, blood clots, low muscle tone, and uh, uh, unusual kind of, of eye disease, common to both diseases. So wh when, I, when I saw that, I said, Let's, the, the, and there's no treatment for mitochondrial disease. So the reason I presented it and the reason they accepted the, the poster was because maybe if some people who have mitochondrial disease start using the regimen we use for MTHFR, it could be helpful for them because right now there's no treatment for it. And they spend millions of dollars every year on research, so I thought, you know, maybe we could help some people. So there's a, a patient came to me, and 46 years old, he said he had dizziness, ringing in his ears, extreme fatigue, daily occipital headaches, this means back here, lack of concentration, astenopia just means eye strain, and photophobia means uh, light sensitivity. And it, it happened two weeks after he started taking a drug for antifungals, and the, the trade name is Lamisil. And uh, with my colleague, uh, who's a, a, a retired professor of pharmacology, Dr. Pagano, we had this published in a pharmacology journal. Okay, so we, we did some baseline. So his homocysteine to start was 10, and in about six weeks we got it down to 8.9, and his vitamin D was low. We got it up. The normal is 30. So we got him up to a good level, and his B12 was fine. And by that time, all the symptoms had gone away. Okay. Now, why does the Lamisil affect um, people who have MTHFR? Is because here in the methylation cycle, this is where the drug works. That's why, how it kills the fungus. It interferes with their methylation. And... <clears throat> So here, here's the MTHFR, here's the homocysteine cycle, and so it just comes in, interferes with the whole thing, and kills the fungus, but also interferes with um, the general methylation because it's taken uh, internally. Okay. Now there are some other mutations that we can help people with. Uh, as I mentioned, mitochondrial disease, APOE is a lipid protein uh, mutation, that there are some people who don't have the chemicals in their body to break down cholesterol. So even if they don't eat any food with cholesterol, the body naturally makes cholesterol, so these people have to be watched and given certain, <coughs> excuse me, supplements to help them. And uh, kidney disease and coroner, all these things we are now starting to discover are uh, mutations that we can deal with through the science of epigenetics. And these are just some references because some people say, well, do you have any proof for what you say? So here's some proof. Okay, so as a summary, we spoke about the Genome Project. We spoke about epigenetics and and how we know it's important, and it's an emerging science. We spoke about methylation and uh, what's related to the MTHFR mutation and other mutations amenable to epigenetics. And that's, that's all. If you have any more questions. Yes.
Okay. The, 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 I can't tell you what other doctors do, but this is what I do. Okay. The, once we find that someone has the MTHFR mutation, okay, we start them with a, a dose of methylfolate supplementation, and they monitor it with the nitric oxide test strips. And then we want to get them to have an optimal amount of nitric oxide, so we increase the methylfolate until they get there. Now, once they're fully methylated, we have the blood test done again for B12, vitamin D, and homocysteine, and then depending on the results of those tests, we either start to supplement vitamin D or B12. Um, th this is something beyond my pay level, how insurance companies work. I, I was in college for 16 years, and I can't figure it out how they work. And it doesn't seem like that's a particularly yeah. expensive test. Though. It's a common test. Yeah, it's not expensive. It's not, it shouldn't be an expensive test. No, the the the. the but that's 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 the that's the everything test. You can just get the, the methylation test for $150. You don't have to do the whole thing. But um, as my friend Ellen knows, before they had this, what was it, $7,000 to have all these tests done? Blood tests? Yeah. So it, it's much, you know, it, it, why didn't, I'm not in a network. So if someone has insurance that's only for network doctors, nothing's covered. But if they're allowed to go to doctors outside the network, then after the deductible, they'll get a certain amount back. But each company, each policy, I've had uh, patients from the same company have completely different policies. One, they'll pay 80%, the other, they won't pay anything. So as I said, I have no idea how insurance companies work. If someone could figure it out, you could become very rich. You, you, you basically have to take it, you can reduce some of the dosages once you reach a good level, but you, you have to monitor yourself and make sure that you're, you're methylated, because you don't want to take any, take any chances. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Particularly related to homocysteine. I, I might have misunderstood, but I, I felt like you were saying that you had an example of ADHD, but the example you gave, no, I, I think was autism. Do you have an ADHD? It, it, it's the same. What you have to do is change the label. You know, I, I don't know if you remember, there used to be a, a television program called Dragnet, and they used to say the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just a change. It's the same thing. The, before there was ADD, they called it minimal brain damage. And no, nobody wanted their child to be labeled that. And, and Sibagagi, the ones who make Ritalin, they're the ones who came out with the MBD, and they found it wasn't going, so they changed it to attention deficit disorder. And it's the same thing. They, they, they got enough people hooked on ADD medication, so they needed something else. So now they have autistic spectrum. And it's, another thing I was thinking about is that aren't those supplements all found in most multivitamins? Not in, not in enough amount. If you go look at... If you go look at your multivitamin, yeah. you're going to see methylfolate is going to be 400 micrograms. And as I said, we like to get people uh, to take 15 because that's usually what it takes to get them to have good nitric oxide. And nitric oxide in and of itself is very important. So, just so I understand, because I'm not in the medical field at all, right? Or you, you know, right? Um, so I understand that if somebody takes enough level Say I've got ADD or I'm on 
Okay, it it will help the treatment. It will help the treatment. So you still need treatment beyond Well, most people do, some people won't. Yeah. But most people will. For example, some uh and, and you know this, there's some of uh, I'm in a volunteer program called Homecoming for Veterans that treats veterans for PTSD. And and, and I, I give them ten sessions for free, ten visit office visits for free. After after we get them methylated and just a few visits, it's like the piece, missing piece in their puzzle because most of the people with PTSD have been playing around with, how can I get rid of this? What's bothering me? Sometimes I feel good, sometimes I don't. And they start, and once all this comes together, it's like, oh, wow, well, now I have it. Do we know any risks of taking such high doses of That's why we monitor it with nitric oxide. And that's, that's given as a gas? Or is that a no, it's a saliva test on a test strip. Oh, that's why you test it, to, to see that they're yeah, not before, before the patients start, we take a baseline of, of the nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. And then after uh, a week, we have them tested, then two weeks, then three weeks, until we get a, a good uh, knowledge of how they're reacting to the supplementation and that their nitric oxide's coming up and doesn't go into the high level. There can be reactions, and and we monitor the patients very carefully. There's some people, if they, they take a little too much, don't feel good, so we have them back down, and then we can give other supplements to help them get methylated. But it's it's something that you need, you need a doctor's care to, to monitor this all very carefully, but when that's done, it's very effective, and it's very helpful. So would it be accurate to say, per the slide that you had from the vascular textbook, that there are risks associated with methylfolate, and the reason that you monitor the nitric oxide is because you definitely don't want to take any more than you need to get the nitric oxide under well, control? Yes, anything in excess isn't, isn't good. Even, even, for example, water. Yes, right. There, there are some studies that, that show that, so we're very careful to, to make sure that we're not over-methylating people. That's all. Any other? Okay, most, most adults end up taking 15 milligrams a day. So you're talking almost four times no. this amount? No, right. no. This, this is micrograms. Oh, wow, so you're talking like 400, 400 times? So it's way more than, yeah. than what this record is. Right. And so, and so, so, so we, 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 right, now th th this is, I'm, I'm not the person who developed uh, the, the dosage or anything. Uh, many other doctors are doing it. Companies make 15 milligram uh, capsules or tablets of methylfolate, and um, that may not be a good indication, but they're not being sued, and there's no uh, reports of horrible mass side effects. That as long as they're monitored uh, and you're careful and you do the other things that are involved in good methylation, uh, it's very, very effective and very helpful, and th there's no side effects. So I remember my question now. Um, so I, I know you mentioned um, those Nobel, the Nobel Prize winners, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there's any Science tends to be slow in general, right? Lots of research, lots of 
research, verification. Okay. So I'm just wondering, like, where are we right now with this in terms of the adoption stage? Okay. So what? We're still here at the forefront. It's starting to be more uh, accepted, um, but it, we're still at the forefront. Uh, for example, um, the, the, the 2013 and 2018 meetings where, that I presented that you saw was for an organization for optometrists who do vision training. And I've been trying since 2013 to uh, allow me to give a, a lecture on methyl methylation, and the, and the, they won't let me do it. Are and, there any and studies, any larger scale studies underway? There's or? there's hundreds and hundreds of studies. Yeah, I mean, so the, 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 this right, is right, but I mean specifically on some of these protocols that you're talking about. Yeah, the, the, there's the, there's lots of information available. It's just what I what I have what I'm what I've done is I packaged hundreds if not thousands of articles into a relatively short presentation just to make people aware of the mutation and what can be done about it. Yeah, so if you notice these, these, these three pages of references, I see the earliest date here is 2004. Yeah, but they aren't necessarily about a protocol of, of putting people on large scale. But, they, but there, are, there, are they? There, there are studies and I don't have time to read. Oh, well, that's okay. I'm just trying to figure it out where we're at in like the quest for knowledge. You know. So I, I see here that this from example is just brought back to track in a couple of two, three, four, five, six different articles or presentations that you made uh, surrounding this one for the last couple of years. Uh, clearly, These are just these are just selected. I mean, sure, 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 sure. Th th there's, there's thousands of articles on this. Your question? Yeah, as far as like CRISPR-Cas9 goes. Say again. I didn't hear. I have a hearing problem. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm against that. You're against that? Yeah, because what, what happens is this. <clears throat> the, the body is created to be in balance. If you're going to just affect one thing and, and not compensate someplace else, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble. And, and, and for example, <clears throat> all the medications that a doctor will prescribe all have side effects. And some of the side effects are worse than the disease that you, you're going there for. Why? Because they're treating only one way, but they're not balancing it another way. And in, in, in my practice, what I do, although I can prescribe many kinds of, of pharmaceutical agents, even narcotics, I don't. I do biofeedback and teach the people how to control their own body body's functions to do this and when you do that it makes good things and inhibits the bad things and puts everything into a balance and in, in 2010 I published a, a paper on the on the hypothalamus which regulates all these functions and all these chemicals and everything it took me 10 years to write it but it clearly shows that the, the body needs to be in balance and it's, and everything has to be in relation to everything else you just can't go into one place and and poke it and not expect other places to react. That's a sort of a follow-up on what you were asking about studies. Like, this is um, my opinion, and I'm asking you if you think I'm on track by saying this. It seems to me that with a lot of the sorts of things that MTHFR mutations can cause, there's a lot more money in pharmaceuticals to treat the illnesses, and I wouldn't necessarily expect um, mainstream medicine to embrace this approach for that reason. I'm wondering if you think that's a 
No, I think you're 100 percent right. You, you, if you, if you, you go, you go into your primary, you go to your primary care practitioner, and he wants to say, you know, I don't feel good. Do you have something you can give me? He goes into this big closet that's filled with samples from the from the drug representative. I mean. I, I, one of the doctors I went to, the closet was as big as this area. Just filled, filled, all kinds of stuff there. Oh, you, you, you don't feel, here, take one of these, here, take one of these, take one of these. Okay, well, thank you, all the people yeah, here you. and those people listening. Have a good night. So we finished just about an hour and a half, just like just like we said. Hi, David. By the way. Hi.